Hello you guys, welcome back to another snaky video. Not a spider video, a snaky video. <laughs> in this video, we're gonna look at a snake that in the in, in UK, hardly anyone's got. In the US, I should imagine hardly anyone's got. Bit more, bit more widely available across Europe, and that is the smooth snake. Now here in the UK, it's our rarest species of snake. In fact, it's really our rarest species of reptile, unless you include the odd sea turtle that washes around the shores. So it's our rarest reptile. And I'd like to tell you here in the UK, if you find one, it's a magnificently beautiful jewel of a snake, or it's incredibly huge, but it's neither. It's beautifully understated. I was gonna say drab, but that's not fair. So a very understated snake and 60 centimeters, I think is probably the maximum it's gonna get. It's a small, understated, unnoticed snake found on very few sort of heathland or, or very few sites in the UK, mostly Southern. Uh, in the UK, if you're not from the UK, the Southern area is that bit warmer and there's still some lovely heathlands. And because this snake is really a specialist in reptile eating, it tends to be found in a limited area where most of our other reptiles are found. So it's got an abundant food source. Most most British people have never seen one in the wild. That, that's absolute fact. Um, I've never seen one in the wild. And to be honest, to disturb them in the wild is an offence without a licence, a bit like our great crested newts and things. They're very fossorial. They stay hidden a lot of the time and pretty nocturnal snakes. But I think really in the wild, their scattered sort of range, um, as well as the fact, the, the way they live, there's probably more than we think. And they're just unobserved. They're just not a species that sort of makes itself seen as easily as an adder or a grass snake in the way it goes about its daily business. In captivity, it can be quite different from that. But I'm gonna say now, that unlike most of the videos where I say I'm not, I don't, I don't piggyback on other people's YouTube videos. I don't scour the internet for information and then just repeat it parrot fashion in a video to make a video to seem like I know more than I do. I'm basing this on a couple of close friends, close observations of my observations of a pair of smooth snakes over the last 12 months in my care. So quite a limited knowledge compared to some of the snakes I breed here and, and li li keep here and have sort of taught you about on this channel. Highly protected in the UK. It's not a snake you can take from the wild. And I think I'm fair to say that the few people working with a snake in the UK, all their snakes were obtained from the European snake shows from continental breeders where the species is more available and more commonly kept. But it still means there's very few people here. I was lucky to get this sort of sub-adult adult, adult pair, a young adult pair, uh, from a fellow enthusiast. Um, and he said to me, Dave, you know, I'm they're going to you because you're going to have them in a place where other people can see them as part of your job or your, your business. And really, I, I want them outside. I don't want to go to someone to keep them inside in an indoor vivaria. I think like most British and European reptiles, but then really all, I guess, if you've got the right climate, they look better and do better outside. But unlike the enclosures I'm building for the grass snakes, adders, that kind of thing, that can be eight foot, 16 foot, whatever, and you'll still see the subjects, it's just a waste of time. A huge outdoor enclosure for these, you're never gonna see them, or it's gonna be incredibly rare and, and wasted, totally wasted on them. Mine are outdoors now, but I'm going to talk you through some of the way they were kept. So mine first went into a really small vivarium. I don't know, two foot, two foot by 12 inches by 12 inches, 60, 30, 30. Um, in a sort of, I can't describe it at work, but in a, let's say in a barn where they're exposed to the outdoor temperatures completely, but they're still technically indoors and they were lit artificially. They were lit with a really small 15 watt pygmy bulb, which with just a little basking spot under there, and then the rest of it was ambient outdoor temperatures. They thrived in there for a year, and they fed really, really well, and they hibernated in there down to minus five. And the temperatures dropped even more last winter, and I did bottle it, I dug them out, and I hibernated them somewhere where they wouldn't go below freezing, just to make sure they survived that hibernation. Furnishing, very simple, a little bit of cork wood, higher up under the basking lamp, a couple of flat rocks and a cork tube to hide in and under. Natural sort of sand, sand, 
sand, soil, peat kind of mix, you know, man-made substrate. So quite naturalistic, a couple of plastic plants and a smaller LED light to make a brighter spot rather than the gloom of the 15 watt pygmy ball. A small water bowl thrived. This spring, once the frost had gone, they went out into a, I think it's a three foot, two and a half foot, three foot exoterra. Bottom drilled, small bit of wire mesh over the bottom so nothing could fall through or escape. Gravel over there, membrane to divide that, so false bottom for drainage. And then again, a sandy soil mixture as the actual substrate. Very free draining, completely mesh screen top. Um, wider mesh than what comes with the exoterra slightly, but a, a, a retrofitted top. Really good mesh on there. It can rain through, it's fully outside, and it's exposed to the sun until in the mid sun, until about five o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon, and then the sun goes off them. The depth of the soil is a few inches. They've got a clay drainage pipe that takes them right down to the gravel layer, and they can get away, they can get away from that heat. We've had mid 30 Celsius this summer so far in the UK. All my outdoor stuff's thrived and been fine. So what I've noticed with the smooth snakes, completely vanish underground with that baking heat through the glass. Don't forget the whole top's mesh, but still really hot through the glass. And then as soon as that sun has gone behind into that, it's been put into shade, goodness me, it's been a very long day doing paperwork and DIY. When the sun's gone off the vivaria about five o'clock in the evening, those guys are straight out. Remember, it's not dark till 10 o'clock in the evening. They're straight out foraging around for food. It's still warm and humid, maybe, but there's no great excessive heat. And they've been absolutely fine in that glass enclosure, in that heat. Feeding them, oh, sorry, water bowl they can get into. Natural plants, there's some thyme, I think, in there, and some of the creeping plants. Uh, slate sort of wall background, and they love that. They get in between all the slates, and they sort of stack themselves up wherever they like in there, feeling really snug and secure, but say, then they're happy to come out and ever since i've had these guys they haven't been all about being nocturnal and hiding away they're out an awful lot they'll finger feed they're very tame and settled and they're feeding on pinky mice thawed out frozen pink thawed out frozen pinky mice and small pinky rats or rat pups hairless absolutely fine i talked with the people because i am concerned that because they're eating this kind of food they're not getting maybe enough calcium, I don't know. There's only so much calcium in a baby animal. Yes, they've probably got milk inside them, but I think possibly putting a little bit of supplement in there, whether it's just, just powdered or under the skin, I don't know. But I think worth a try if that's all they're going to eat. Other people have suggested chunks of beef heart. and have tried chick legs, they're not interested. But that's how mine have been kept for a year, and they feed very, very well. They'll eat multiple pinky mice and, and a rat pup and so on and so forth. Good feeders. Um sort of a naturalistic setup i think i like it they like it no problems with feeding haven't bred yet we've got to wait and see those that have bred them have all reported to get them feeding they've had to do sort of sneaky tricks like buy a cheap gecko bless them from the pet shop freeze it chop it up get them eating chunks of gecko meat or lizard meat which is their natural diet in the wild and then obviously scent pinkies and bits of pinky and move on from there but they're not going to be something you're going to get feeding easily as hatchlings, or if you know what I mean. They're going to need that bit of scent feeding. Yeah, to me, not very nice if you've got to kill a lizard or something, but that's what I've heard reported. I can't vouch for it, but that's what definitely acquaintances and friends of mine have done to get those guys feeding. And they've all got them feeding very quickly on lizard meat. If you are going to keep these guys indoors, I'm sure they're gonna thrive. You know, we keep all these tropical and temperate snakes all over the world for generations and generations, long living in captivity, fully indoors with with or without any light whatsoever. Uh, I'm sure these snakes will thrive. They're very special here in the UK and I think people that keep them really want them to have the best and that natural setup. And a lot of people here keeping European reptiles and herbs here in the UK tend to like to keep them outdoors because we can, we can. And it's free, isn't it? Electricity wise as well. And it's better for the animal. They are getting all that natural climate as well. Would they thrive indoors? I'm sure they would. I think I'd have a slightly damp area in a substrate. Uh, I wouldn't go too hot. I'd have a localised basking spot, you know, 28 degrees. But the rest of the enclosure much, much cooler. So they can totally escape the heat and come and go. 
and a decent substrate that they can get under things and uh, I think that'll be completely fine because although mine were sort of in a barn they were also in a in a very much a indoor setup kind of setup if that makes sense beautiful snakes completely non-aggressive um, one of mine's given me a nip once when I sort of pulled them out from hibernation tiny teeth it's not really going to matter to you they handle lovely they are smooth um, they're called smooth snakes by the way because in the UK our minuscule amount of reptiles our other common snakes that adder and the grass snake have got all fully keeled scales whereas a smooth snake has smooth scales so in the greater world who cares nothing new but in Britain they were called a smooth snake because they were the smooth so now in the UK there's a rising surge of of people keeping in captivity British slash European species and rightly so I think this this keeping of European species in the UK it's the way forward because we can keep these things outside um, which is which is great because it's much less electricity there's no costs involved in that which is crippling all of us UK keepers at the moment the high energy prices but what would be a huge enclosure in your house would be quite a small area for most people that have a garden so you're enabled to set up totally naturalistic looking enclosures much more that to come on the channel here and give your charges more naturalistic lives and much more room now when it comes to smooth snakes yeah they're not going to care if they're in a three foot indoor enclosure or a three foot enclosure that's huge for them that's huge for them but for other stuff i'm hoping this year to get out my european legless lizards the glass lizards the shelter pusics outside they're currently in a six foot by two foot indoor vivaria and that's sort of quite big. That's quite big for most people's collections. A 6B2 is kind of the top end. And then it goes sort of real bespoke made, made sizes. But for most people, 6B2 enclosures for their herbs are big. They're going in an 8 foot by 8 foot outside. Sort of four or five times bigger. And the outside, it doesn't seem very big at all. You can really, you can really take this European and British keeping legally. Obviously, as long as they're legal. And of course, you really want these things captured bred where you can, of course. But the outdoor keeping is a, a movement that's coming along and the smooth snakes, if more and more people can breed these smooth snakes in captivity, hopefully more and more people, rather than just the outliers like myself, the lucky few, if you like, will start to have them available because they're a fantastic species to study. You can keep them outside. You can keep them in relatively small spaces. You can handle them, but really nice in a nice natural setup. They're a wonder to behold, despite being relatively plain and relatively small uh their latin name coronella because they've got a lovely crown sort of marking on their head so a short video hopefully something different something that most of you haven't seen before haven't thought of before is it irrelevant well no because youtube's here forever or it's here for a, a long time much much more years than today when this video is being made and i would like to think people will get interested in them once they're being bred in the UK right now, if you wanted a smooth snake, you're going to really struggle. I know one guy's got several, um, and he won't part with any. I know another guy with some, he doesn't want to part with any. And I know someone else that's desperate for a mate for hers and can't find one anywhere. No one will part with them. There's just not enough at the moment. But I think once these people with relatively small groups get breeding them successfully, then they're going to become more available. So sort of hang in there for this amazing species. For me personally, it's really important. I've got a little British wildlife menagerie and the whole point is to push this British stuff forward to the UK public. Yes, we've got a fox. Yes, we've got hedgehogs and polecats, cute, fluffy stuff. But my job, uh, doing part of my talks, my weekend talks, is to really get them to appreciate the things they can help for sure. Now, most people can't do anything to help the smooth snake at home. But of course, it's all part of that. You can encourage slow worms, grass snakes, toads, frogs, newts in your gardens and do something tangible to help them. So that's why I have smooth snakes um, and they're a really important part of my team. Hope you've enjoyed the video. I know it's been a waffle. Hopefully I've managed to overlay with quite a bit of footage um, just so you can understand what I mean and appreciate these lovely, lovely animals. And I'm hoping it as well. You know, sometimes, although it's a video about stuff that at the moment most of you can't have or, or can't get your hands on, it's also interesting to learn about new stuff and other stuff and stuff we don't keep. Hope you've enjoyed it. Please subscribe.
keep watching the channel. As you know, it, it morphs weekly between all the different genres. Next week it might be spiders, next week it might be snakes again, next week it could be something completely different on this this Saturday night video, the, the reptile side of things. But check in, check back, please subscribe, click on the bell, you know the wrap, and I'll see you soon. Thanks so much for watching.